I want to share this book called Happy for No Reason, Seven Steps to Being Happy from the Inside Out. It was a number one New York Times bestseller by uh, Marcy Shimoff and Carol Klein. I got it uh, secondhand from a consignment store, and so it actually has this lovely crinkle from being water damaged. I didn't do it. Um, but uh, I love this book and I wanted to share some with you. But before we do that, I wanted to show you this mug. Now, I have used it in other videos, but I never did tell you about it. This is my mama. This is me. And this is my daughter, and this is my granddaughter. My daughter, Catherine, captured this photograph of the four generations together. I thought that was so cool. And then she had it put on a mug by Love It Designs, made in Montana, USA. Designsmontana.com, 406 T seven two six two two one. I'm sure you, uh, there's a lot of other companies that do that, but she did, she had it done up there and sent that to me, and I thought that was so precious. She found it was an older picture. Uh, my mom has since passed, and um, my granddaughter is now grown up. She's 24, and she is. Married and having a bebe. And so that makes me a great grandmother. I am so excited about that. I'm going to be a great grandmother. I wish my mom had lived to see it. And so I'm going to fill this up with some coffee. But first, you know, I have to do my commercial. Commercial time. Fabula Coffee. This is something that I am hardly making any, any money on at all. I can't make any money on it unless somebody places an order. But I just keep pushing it because I so believe in it. Fabula Coffee. 100% organic low acid and that is what impresses the heck out of me uh, because it has really saved my gut. I can drink coffee freely now because I have what you call a hiatal hernia and uh, coffee's really bad for me but this has changed the game. Uh, a hug and a cup, have as many as you want, 100% organic low acid single origin, and I believe that origin is Mexico. There it is, Mexico. And I drink a decaf. It even says what the varietal of coffee bean is. It says bourbon, pluma, tipica. And the process is fully washed mountain water process decaffeination. That's because of well, me drinking decaf. Fresh roast, low acid, high elevation, small batch, organic coffee. Organic and low acid. You cannot lose. Uh, it is quite expensive, I don't deny that, but I need it and I want it, so I'm paying for it. Okay, that's enough of a commercial. Let me go get some of this wonderful, fabulous coffee to drink while we read. Okay, I got a nice steamy hot cup of coffee. I'm trying not to be really loud in my sipping because there are a few people who hate that sound. Okay, happy for no reason. Let us just begin with the beginning. Here's uh, praise for happy no, for no reason. Lots of people reviewing the book and giving it great praise. OK, 
Okay, happiness that's here to stay is part one. Part two is building your home for happiness. Um, part three is happy for no reason ever after. Many different chapters. Welcome to a happier life. Happy for no reason, really. Practicing happiness. The foundation, take ownership of your happiness. Pillar of the mind, don't believe everything you think, absolutely. Let love lead, make yourselves happy, plug yourself into spirit. Live a life inspired by purpose, cultivate nourishing relationships. So that's uh, those chapters, this one. that's here to stay, the joy I have, the world didn't give it, the world can't take it away, a quote by Shirley Caesar, gospel singer, <laughs> yeah, introduction, welcome to a happier life, uh, she begins with a story, but I don't think I'll read that, well, maybe I will. I was crammed in the back of an ancient flatbed truck with 30 other Westerners bumping down a rock-strewn dirt road heading toward the foothills of the Himalayas. We each had a bandana covering our nose and mouth to keep us from choking on the dust. We were on our way to a small remote mountain village where we would provide humanitarian support for the villagers' education, medical, and housing needs. I was tired, grumpy, and sore all over. After six hours, the driver stopped the truck, got out, and unceremoniously hauled all our luggage onto the dusty ground. <laughs> You'll need to walk the rest of the way, he said. It's another mile, and from here on, the road is too steep and narrow for my truck. As the truck rattled off, I looked at my 91-pound suitcase with dread. Why had I packed all that unnecessary stuff? Ridiculous. I tried dragging it a few yards up the rough mountain trail, but it was hopeless. I wasn't strong enough. Dusk was falling. What could I do? Everyone else in the group was wrestling with their own bags. No one could help me. But they were managing to make their way up the hill and soon were nearly out of sight. I sat down and spent a couple of minutes fighting down a rising panic. Were there tigers here? Then a tiny barefoot old woman, her face seamed with wrinkles, came out of the forest and up the road toward me. She approached me with a warm smile, picked up my bag, and astonishingly hoisted it up onto her head as though it weighed no more than a basket of fruit. Well, a basket of fruit can be heavy depending on how big the basket is. And then she headed up the hill, motioning for me to follow. As we ventured up the path together, though we had no luggage in common, I was struck by the twinkle in her eyes and the simple happiness that she exuded. When we finally reached the top of the mountain, I was met with the huge smiles and enthusiastic greetings of her fellow villagers. I spent the next two weeks circling uh, working side by side with these people, attending to the children, preparing food, and help, and helping administer medical care. Like them, I slept on the ground, bathed in the river, and drank milk fresh from the cow. To my surprise, I found that this non-frills lifestyle agreed with me. I felt clear, peaceful, and full of energy. During my stay, I also spent a lot of time observing my mountain hosts. Here were people who had no electricity or running water, living on the bare minimum with no creature comforts. Yet there was a lightness of spirit, a sense of humor, and an easy friendliness about them that was remarkable. They were simply happy from the inside out. 
course, I realized that their happiness wasn't a product of their poverty. I had seen plenty of dirt poor men, women, and children in all corners of the world who were utterly miserable. I'd also met people with every shiny, expensive toy money could buy who were ecstatic about their good fortune, as well as fabulously wealthy folks who were living proof of the saying, money cannot buy happiness. The experience reinforced my conviction that happiness isn't about having everything you've ever dreamed of, nor is it simply negating the need for material pleasures in life. It goes deeper than that. What we're all really looking for is happiness from within that doesn't depend on external circumstances, the kind I call happy for no reason. My time among the Himalayan villagers crystallized my goal. Without giving up on my regular life, I wanted to find a way to enjoy that kind of happiness no matter where I was or what I was doing. Chances are you picked up this book for the very same reason. If you're human, it comes with a package. Everyone, everywhere wants to be happy. You might already be happy and just want to crank up the volume a notch or two. Or you may be seriously unhappy and wondering how others around you manage to find delight in their lives. Perhaps you've created your version of the American dream, but still feel an emptiness inside that nothing on the outside seems to fill. The good news is that it doesn't matter where you begin. Wherever you are right now, this book will show you how to be happier. You don't have to have happy genes, win the lottery, or become a saint. By the time you finish reading these pages, you will know how to experience an authentic state a sustained happiness for the rest of your life. That's quite a promise, isn't it? (laughs) Okay, let's take a look around here a little bit. The study of happiness, all of this, tells her story about her journey to becoming happier. Happiness is the meaning and the purpose of life, the whole aim and end of human existence. Aristotle. (laughs) Interesting. Okay. One of the first things that they talk about... People are happier than others. If you and I were sitting over some tea at a sidewalk cafe and I asked, are you happy? What would your answer be? A few of you might say, absolutely. If I were any happier, I'd be twins. (laughs) A lot of you would probably reply sometimes. But I'd bet dollars to donuts that at least half of you would say, no, not really. Some people enjoy their lives no matter what happens, while others can't find happiness no matter how hard they try. Most of us fall somewhere in between. Let me see something here. Happiness, for any reason, is just another form of misery. (laughs) Um. Okay, so one day as I sat down to compile my findings, all the pieces of the puzzle fell into place. I had a simple but profound aha. There's a continuum of happiness. Continuum of happiness. She describes. 
describes happiness, having a sense of lightness or buoyancy, feeling alive, vital, energetic, having a sense of flow and openness, feeling love and compassion for yourself and others, having passion about your life and purpose, feeling gratitude, forgiveness, being at peace with life, and being fully present in the moment. Okay, how happy for no reason are you? Okay, so they give a quiz, and this is a quiz that I took uh, in my study video. And uh, they ask, question one is, it's not a question. I often feel happy and satisfied for no particular reason. And you just answer, not at all true, slightly true, moderately true, mostly true, absolutely true. So I took that test. And I scored in the um, okay, and I think I might have been in this group. You have a good measure of being happy for no reason. Now I don't remember what my score was, but it was in one of these top two. happiness. Things do not change. We change. The habits of happy people. People with happiness set points are human just like the rest of us. They don't have special powers, an extra heart or x-ray vision. They just have different habits. It's that simple. Psychologists say that at least 90% of all behavior is habitual, so to become happier, you need to look to your habits. You can't just decide to be happy any more than you can decide to be fit or to be great piano virtuoso and expect instant mastery. All of your habitual thoughts and behaviors in the past have created specific neural pathways in the wiring in your brain like grooves in a record. When we think of be or behave a certain way over and over, the neural pathway is strengthened and the groove becomes deeper in the way that a well-traveled route through a field eventually becomes a clear-cut path. Unhappy people tend to have more negative neural pathways. This is why you can't just ignore the realities of your brain's wiring and decide to be happy. To raise your happiness set point, you have to create new grooves. And I can definitely testify to that. My own um, experience with this and the reason why I would pick up a book like this is because I fought uh, my own personal battle with depression for many years, uh, and I found uh, some support groups through the 12-step recovery program that dealt with it. It's uh, the relationship ones like um, Codependence Anonymous and Al-Anon and these different uh, groups that actually address uh, adult children of alcoholics. There, there was all kinds of groups that I attended and tried and learned and I went through the 12 steps and um, and got a hold of a lot of good books. One of them was one um, called Feeling Good by David something or other and um, learned to train my thoughts. And then I also got a book called Codependent No More, and I got a book, oh my goodness, I just read and read and read and joined support groups, and I will never go back into a full-blown depression again. I get slightly depressed now and then, blue, and uh, unhappy for moments of time, and then I go to work. I go to work on the 
thoughts and the feelings and give it to God and trust a friend with my thoughts and feelings and eventually the depression and the sadness passes. Okay, this is one of the myth of more. Yeah, okay, so that's going to be obvious. They're going to talk about who is rich, he who is happy with his lot. That comes from the Talmud, and that is absolute truth. We won't be happy when happiness is not circumstantial. Oh, there it is. <laughs> the myth of I'll be happy when. I'll be happy when I have the perfect mate. I'll be happy when I have a better job. I'll be happy when I have a baby. I'll be happy when the kids are in school. And so on and so forth. And it uh, goes on ad nauseum because everybody has their own lists of what they believe will make them happy. Okay, the guiding principle number one is what expands you makes you happier. Science has shown that everything in the universe, including you, is composed of energy. Everything you say, think, or do, everything you're around either expands your energy or it contracts it. When your energy expands, you experience great happiness. When your energy contracts, you experience less happiness. So here's the opposites here. This is when you feel happy, you're free, open, joyful, and there's a feeling of lightness and space. That's expansion. So when you feel unhappy or upset, you're contracting. And so that's the feeling of anxiousness. You're tight, agitated, and there's a feeling of heaviness. That's contraction. So... Think of someone you fear or are angry at. What do you feel? That same heavy, contracted energy. This is our basic experience of unhappiness. All of our negative emotions, anger, fear, sadness, jealousy, contract us and literally constrict the flow of life energy. Contraction, expansion. So, they give you a list of contraction is unhappiness, fear, pessimism, constriction, resistance, low energy, disease, malaise, separation, feeling bad. Expansion is happiness, love, optimism, flow, acceptance, vitality, ease, well-being, connection, and feeling good. If you feel contracted, it's time for a course correction. Writing to him. This book is so good. The universe is out to support you. Guiding principle number three. So number one was what expands you makes you happier. That was guiding principle number one. Number two is the universe is out to support you. Nobody's out there trying to make you personally unhappy. Guiding principle number three, what you appreciate, appreciates. Becomes more valuable. Um, setting your intention and envisioning your ideal. So... We're not trying to reach goals in order to find a thing or a situation to make us happy. We are actually going to try to work on becoming happy. Part two, building your home for happiness. Foundation. Most of the shadows of this life are caused by standing in one's own sunshine. <laughs> That's Ralph Waldo Emerson. Okay, so building your home for happiness, you need to be taking ownership. A 
accepting that being happy is up to you and that you have the ability and power to be happier by changing your habits. And that's kind of where it starts. You can't exercise becoming happy for no reason unless you admit that it's up to you. Mm. And the second part of that statement is taking responsibility, responding to all the events in your life in a way that supports your happiness. So you can even be happy through your trials. Our ability to respond to what happens to us dramatically affects our happiness. That's the way you think about what's happening to you. And that was something, um, this is uh, reiterating a lot of what um, I read, uh, learned in my 12-step groups, and that is that in the process of changing your mind, say an, an event happens to you, around you, and um, you can think, this is the most horrible thing in the world to ever happen, and it's going to last forever, and I'm going to die. Or you can think uh, more positive thoughts and um, not have the victim mentality and why me and it, it, yeah, so that's a, a good habit is as soon as something difficult happens, you go to work on your thoughts regarding what is happening. The ultimate victor, the happiness robbers. Oh, here they, now see here they talk about it. That's so funny. I keep getting one step ahead of her. A victim identity is the belief that the past is more powerful than the present, which is the opposite of the truth. It is the belief that other people and what they did to you are responsible for who you are now for your emotional pain or your inability to be your true self. The truth is that the only power there is is contained within this moment. Once you know that, you realize you are responsible for your inner space now. Nobody else is. And the past cannot prevail against the power of the now. Absolutely perfect wisdom. Uh, we're always free in the present moment to break our old habits and to establish happiness habits. Complaining. Uh, feeling sorry for ourselves, trying to garner sympathy or being a martyr or an overgiver or they're all dead giveaways that we're the guest of honor at our own pity party. <laughs> that was something else too that I had to learn was that... Uh, Self-pity had so much to do with my depression. Um, uh, complaining is like putting an order into the universe for one more of what we don't want. Poor me. Uh, blaming. Blaming our circumstances by making excuses or blaming others for our pain or our problems. That weakens us. We give our power away and the energy we need to deal with the situation isn't available because we're directing it at someone or something else. The blamer's motto is, it's not my fault. Mm. A lot of things aren't our fault, and we do need to recognize that we have been victims of abuse. But you can't go through your life saying, oh, okay, it's uh, my dad's fault because he abused me. Oh, it's my husband's fault and I'll never be happy for the rest of my life because they did this. And so it's one thing to understand the origins of your pain and your um, sufferings, but it's another thing now to, uh, you know, take responsibility now that you're an adult. Um, so... Oh. Yeah, here's another one. Feeling shame. When we turn blame onto ourselves, uh, feel ashamed about the things that have happened to us, or feel guilty about 
something we've done or not done, we often try to suppress the pain or bury these uncomfortable feelings deep inside. And this uses up a lot of energy and blocks our happiness. The shamer's motto, it's all my fault. <laughs> I've lived on both sides of the fence. Nabbing the happiness robbers. Think of the unhappy people you know. They probably spend a lot of time blaming, complaining, and feeling shame, which robs them of the experience of their innate happiness. Shifting out of the victim game is a sure way to expand your energy and be happier. Focus on the solution. If you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, change your attitude. Don't complain. That's a quote from Maya Angelou, and author and poet. Yes, Maya Angelou. Um, they say it's never too late to change your habits. Have you ever heard that old saying, worrying is like a rocking chair? It takes a lot of energy and doesn't get you anywhere. The same goes for complaining. I'm sure that at one time or another you've complained about a situation or a problem that's bothered you and gotten quite worked up over it. Imagine taking that same energy and applying it to solving the problem and using your creativity, intelligence, and imagination to see the possibilities. Which one makes you feel happier? Mm -hmm. Okay, story. Here's an exercise. They say to write down your answers to the questions below on a separate piece of paper. Think of a situation that you've been complaining about and rate how you feel about it on a scale of 1 to 10. Okay, so they give you five steps. Five steps there. Shelley's story. Another exercise. Look for the lesson and the gift. Make peace with yourself. Oh, these exercises will be excellent to do. Um, make peace with yourself. We never, we can never obtain peace in the outer world until we make peace with ourselves. His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. To make peace with yourself, it's important to free up your energy by accepting any feelings you've been avoiding and by letting go of the past. When you do, you'll be able to move your life forward and experience greater expansion and happiness. Oh, yes. I know for myself that I have an, an idealistic uh, I, past. Yeah, some good, some bad. Uh, and I love nostalgia, as you can see by uh, my channel. Um, so re recreating it is great, and I can enjoy a certain amount of nostalgia about the past, but I do need to make sure that I'm not thinking that now is no good because it doesn't measure up to the past in so many ways because the, the times that we were happy in the past are not, um, it's like anything, the bad things or the good things that happened, they blow up in your mind and they either get less or more, um, um, exaggerated in your mind. The pillar of the mind don't believe everything you think. Oh my gosh, exactly. Change, uh, what was it? What did I say? Oh, the book called Feeling Good was, uh, that I read years ago it just taught you how to change your mind. 
and not to believe the things that you start thinking about yourself on a knee-jerk reaction, you know. <laughs> Give up the way I think. Isn't that like saying I have to stop breathing? Well, it's not as hard as it may sound. From my research, my own experience, and my interviews with happy, the happy 100, I've learned some powerful techniques for changing the way we think. In this chapter, I'll show you that the ways that allow your mind to support your happiness rather than to sabotage it. How many times a day are you ambushed by negative thoughts? I'm not good enough. My husband or wife doesn't love me. I hate the way I look. I'm worried I won't be able to pay my bills. My daughter doesn't respect me. I'm so stupid. I can't stand this job. If you're like most people, it's probably a lot. We say very self-deprecating things to ourselves and believe it, actually. Those are the thoughts you have to get out of your mind. So using her, her pattern of contraction expansion, thinking negative thoughts, judging, worrying, overthinking, and dwelling on the bad, that's going to make you unhappy. You're contracting. Expansion is thinking positive thoughts, accepting, trusting, clear thinking, and savoring the good. Don't believe everything. Your thoughts aren't always true. It sounds simple enough, but in fact the revolutionary idea requires a major shift in your perspective. Thoughts are just packets of energy formed by neurochemical events in your brain which can be measured in terms of electrical impulses and waves. Your thoughts don't always give you an accurate, accurate picture of reality. Yet your mind goes on broadcasting them anyway. Then you shine a light on your negative thoughts and see that you don't have to believe them. It takes away much of their power to create misery. brain new tricks, though your brain is hardwired to be Velcro for an activity. Mm. Unlike an old dog, your brain really can learn new tricks. Changing your thoughts produces changes in your brain and perhaps even in your DNA, which would affect your health. Happiness habits for the mind. Question your thoughts. Go beyond the mind and let go. Incline your mind toward joy. Another book I love is called Let Go, Let God, or Letting Go. No, it's just called Letting Go. Daily devotionals that talk about the different ways of letting go because... Uh, letting go is an aspect of changing your mind. We are disturbed not by what happens to us, but by our thoughts about what happens. Epictetus. Is it true? Can you absolutely know that it's true? How do you react when you believe that thought? Who would you be without that thought? Uh, yeah, I mean, some of us have gotten so um, familiar with our own thoughts that to actually let them go um, and believe something different makes us feel almost bereft in a way. Look at here in bold. All suffering comes from believing our thoughts. How do I feel? Let's see. Okay. Um, okay. 
is a mini worksheet. How do you react? I had a um, go beyond the mind and let go. If you let go a little, you will have a little peace. If you let go a lot, you will have a lot of peace. If you let go completely, you will have complete peace. I used to take, um, I created my own chart, and um, whenever something happened to me, I would then go to my chart immediately and uh, write down what happened, um, how it made me feel, what my thoughts were, and it was really hard to locate my thought. I, I, I was going, I don't know what I'm thinking, actually. And it was hard to identify my feelings as well. I was going, man, everything is so, like they talked about earlier in the book, it's, it's in a groove, you know? You're just, you go to that thought and that feeling immediately and so quickly that you, that you can't, I had to work really hard to identify what the thoughts and feelings were. And that was only just so I could do the work of then filling out the last part of the column, which said, what's true? And telling myself the truth and being honest. Are my thoughts correct? Are my thoughts wrong? Uh, are my feelings, uh, your feelings are always valid, you, you, that's a given, but many of our feelings come from our thoughts, so if you can capture your thoughts and train yourself to tell yourself the truth of the situation and like, okay, let me see if I can come up with an example. Um, uh, my husband yells at me. Okay, he just yells at me because I can't understand what he's trying to tell me. Let's just use that. That's a good one. My first knee-jerk reaction is defensiveness. Okay, so if I was to go to my uh, worksheet and I would write down, what happened? My husband yelled at me. What do I feel? Oh, I feel rejected. What do I think? Oh, I'm so dumb. Or I'm thinking, he doesn't love me. These are extremes. Nevertheless, they uh, could be, you know, in that groove of thoughts, just automatic from your past or whatever. So then what I had to do is then take the right-hand column and say, what is the truth? Am I stupid? Am I dumb? I am not dumb. My husband loves me. <laughs> and I had to write down the truth. And inevitably, it absolutely changed how I felt about the whole incident. And... Yeah, it's, uh, and then, uh, sometimes it would actually help me resolve the issue with mm, thinking about my ex-husband in this circumstance. Okay, the letting go process. Make yourself comfortable and focus inwardly. Focus on an issue that you would like to feel better about, and then allow yourself to feel whatever you're feeling in this moment. This doesn't have to be a strong feeling. In fact, if you are feeling numb, flat, cut off, or empty inside, those are feelings, and that can be let go of just as easily as the recognizable ones. You ask yourself, could I let this feeling go? Whew, that's powerful. Would I let this go? Am I willing to let go? When would I let go? Well, that's, I 
I've got to st study this more because I have so much more I could learn. Happiness habit for the mind number three, incline your mind toward joy. What a wonderful life I've had. I only wish I'd realized it sooner. <laughs> That's good. Colette, 20th century French novelist. That's so true. One evening, a Cherokee elder told his grandson about the battle that goes on inside people. He said, My son, the battle is between two wolves that live inside us all. One is unhappiness. It is fear, worry, anger, jealousy, sorrow, self-pity, resentment, and inferiority. The other is happiness. It is joy, love, hope, serenity, kindness, generosity, truth, and compassion. The grandson thought about it for a minute and, and asked his grandfather, Which wolf wins? The old Cherokee simply replied, The one you feed. Many of us have heard that classic um, metaphor, allegory, um, and we've just thought, oh yeah, that's true, but no one, or very few people will actually go to work on figuring out how to feed the right wolf for your own happiness. Okay, low self-esteem... Mirror, lean into the thought that makes you feel happier, register the positive, exercise throughout the day, look around you with an eye to giving out awards, okay, this one is chapter 5, the pillar of the heart, let love lead. I would rather have eyes that cannot see, ears that cannot hear, lips that cannot speak, than a heart that cannot love. Robert Tyson In the center of your own body there is a small shrine in the form of a lotus flower, and, with it in, and within it can be found a small space. The heavens and the earth are there, the sun, the moon, the stars and fire and lightning and winds, the whole universe dwells within our hearts. Adapted from the Upanishads. I don't know. Mm. I don't know what that is. The heart has an energy field. It has a good beat and it's easy to dance to. <laughs> can be divided into two basic categories, love and fear. Absolutely. Contraction uh, is when we fear, have fear, anger, sadness, tension, disappointment, emptiness, resentment, self-centeredness, heart rhythm, incoherence. Expansion is love, openness, gratitude, forgiveness, loving kindness, and heart rhythm coherence. Happiness habits for the heart is focus on gratitude, practice forgiveness, spread loving kindness. If the only prayer you said in your whole life was thank you, that would suffice. By Meister Eckhart. <laughs> I do agree with that statement. Have you ever felt your heart swell in gratitude? Have you ever wanted to spread your arms wide and shout, Thank you, thank you, thank you? Then you know what I mean when I say gratitude is a natural heart expander. Yet, it's easy to take things for granted. How much time during the day do you actually focus on gratitude compared to the time that you spend about thinking about the problems in your life? Mm -hmm. Thank you for everything. why gratitude works. How can something as simple as gratitude be such a powerful tool for creating happiness in our lives? And the answer lies in the law of attraction. 
Remember the third principle of the guiding three. What you appreciate, appreciates. In other words, it becomes more valuable. If you want more good in your life, rather than focusing your energy on the problems and obstacles, focus your attention on what's already good and what's working. This automatically draws more good to you. I'm not suggesting you use gratitude as a way to deny, ignore, suppress, or sugarcoat painful feelings. Rather, gratitude is a way to incline your heart toward joy. Um, now that she mentions um, in denying or sugarcoating painful feelings, um, you know, I, I was in a, a relationship that was very abusive and one of the things that I did have to realize, um, there's two types of people, well, I can't say that there's only two, but, um, many of us who are in the school of thought, like, everything's my fault, and then there's the others that are the abusers who are, have a hard time seeing that things that they're doing are their fault, you know, and so it's like, um, to change... Um, okay, let me see, let me back up. Um, I was the type who felt like that uh, my being abused was my fault and that there was something that I could do to make that better. And so hearing somebody tell me that I would need to just be grateful would have pissed me off big time um, because... I was being abused, and it was not my imagination. So, there were all kinds of well-meaning things that people said to me under those circumstances, but it wasn't uh, until um, I was rescued from that uh, horrible situation that uh, I was able to then um, take a look at the part that I played in the attracting of these abusive situations to myself, but meanwhile, um, these kind of things sounded like platitudes. Anyone who's in, in a very uh, abusive situation must come out of that, um, and so, you know, st uh, stuff like this, who, that were, they're talking about gratitude and and um, doing things like changing your mind, and you know, all of these things are great for those who are in a safe place. But if you're not, you need to get out and get safe. And then you can start working on this. But there's many people who don't feel safe, um, even though there is no actual harm coming to them, but they, it's, it's something that's ingrained, so, um, this is the book for that kind of person where, um, they're anxious, grateful for no reason, gratitude and action, tools from the heart math experts saying your thank yous, these are all just really, really important exercises. Oh, forgiveness, mm -hmm. forgiveness for others. Um, this person that had abused me um, eventually within the 12 step group, uh, I was able to make amends to and forgive the person that had abused me, and that set my heart free, and I could become less depressed and free. Why forgive? Few of us are faced with experiences as heartbreaking as Mary's, which I didn't read her story, but... If Mary could forgive her son's killer, then maybe we can forgive the people who've wronged us. Wow. Why is it so hard to forgive? Here's the five main reasons. Do any sound familiar to you? We think that forgiveness means condoning the wrong behavior. That was incredibly important for me to, to um, realize that 
forgiving uh, this individual who abused me was not the same thing as condoning their behavior. We think forgiveness means we have to let that person back into our lives. Excellent. We do not have to let them back into our lives. We think feeling hatred for that person somehow gives us control, power, or strength. Definitely not true. We feel that if we forgive, we might get hurt again, and we want to punish the offender. As it turns out, they're all off the mark. Forgiveness isn't about the person being forgiven. It's a gift you give yourself that allows your heart to stop being contracted. Absolutely. Absolutely. Spread loving kindness. You can restart your heart's flow by sending loving kindness to anyone and everyone you see. It doesn't have to be dramatic. Sometimes simply wishing others well switches on the pump that generates love in the heart. This creates a strong current of love and happiness because a heart overflowing in love is continually being filled with more love. Amen. That's so true. Okay. Call to serve. Cultivating nourishing relationships. Oh, that one's huge. Oh, goodness. Uh, this uh, video is probably getting too long. And um, surround yourself with support. Incredibly important. Yes, relationships, support groups, surrounding yourself with people. See the world as your family. Absolutely. Um, on and on, just this book is gold. It's gold. Whether you are uh, a Christian like me or not, the principles within this book are absolutely applicable and helpful to anyone who will take the time to read it. I appreciate y'all taking time to be with me today. I hope you enjoyed that and learned a little something. Maybe think about going out and getting this book. Okay, I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.